Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 is where we're going to start reading here in just a couple of moments. Now, most children's Bible versions of the book of Exodus begin here. They begin with the story of Moses is in the basket. We know the Israelites are slaves, but that's the first place typically that we begin when we're young. But I think we've learned something, having spent some time in chapter 1, that what God has set up, how the stage has been set, how we have seen the hand of God at work, even in chapter 1, sets up the story, the power of the story that we're going to start reading here in Exodus chapter 2. Pharaoh has been playing the role of tyrant, and even though his success is a little spotty, the the midwives refuse to kill the babies. And even though possibly many in the Egyptian culture are doing that, we see that already there is this subversion of the work of evil and tyranny by those who are obeying the law of life that God has put inside of our hearts and minds. And so as we continue, we've got Pharaoh the tyrant set up, and so we're asking questions like, will his tyranny succeed? What will happen? How will this be broken? And long before we read about Pharaoh's tyranny coming to an end by the overwhelming power of God, we watch how God begins to work in sort of unexpected and subversive ways through the lives of literally unnamed people here in Exodus chapter 2. So God begins to work in unexpected but powerful ways. A mom and a dad defy that death edict. And more and more women, remember, we're noticing this in the first couple of chapters, more and more women here in Exodus decide that killing babies is a bad idea. And then inside of this story, a boy who should have been killed ends up being raised in Pharaoh's home, receives probably the best life that the world could give at that time, including the best education that the world probably could have given at that time. And then like the Old Testament likes to do, it surprises us, the Old Testament loves irony. Ultimately, the end of Pharaoh's reign is being raised under his own roof. It's amazing what happens by God's power. So in chapter two, Moses actually enters the story. We're gonna get essentially in chapter two basically three stories about Moses and his life before Moses meets God in the desert. But these quick stories in chapter two continue this theme of a sovereign God who is at work in ways that we just do not expect. We read about the evil intentions of powerful people, but then we learn again that God is just not stopped by that. So there are two big ideas for us this morning in the passage that we're gonna deal with. First of all, God works in the obedience of his people. In one case, they are the children of Israel. Two Levites have a son. And they decide we're going to do everything that we can to save the life of this baby boy. In another case, we get this character, Pharaoh's daughter. She's not part of the Hebrew children. She's not a child of Israel, but she obeys the law of God, the law that is deeper and stronger than the law of Pharaoh, and she decides to save a child. And God is going to work in the obedience of his people. And then we're going to make note of this as well this morning. Moses makes a choice. Moses is raised in the home of Pharaoh. In fact, the text tells us specifically he became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's a pretty powerful thing to say inside of this context with a Hebrew child. So he's raised inside of that home with everything that comes with being raised in Pharaoh's household. On the other hand, his blood relations are slaves. So what's Moses going to choose? What will be the consequences of the choice that he makes? Some very powerful things happen inside of this passage this morning. So let's begin reading. In Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, friends, this is the word of the Lord. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. 
When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now a man of the house of Levi takes as a wife, a woman from the house of Levi, and they have a baby boy. Turns out they have a family. We know of at least three siblings inside of this family. But recall that very early on, the book of Exodus does not have chapter and verse divisions. So if you're sitting in synagogue and you're listening to this all being read, the very last thing that you read before you closed your Bible for devotionals at night and saw, thought, I'll get to chapter two tomorrow. There's no division there. The Pharaoh had ordered that all of Egypt would take the boys of Israel, and when they were born, they would throw them in the Nile to drown. It's the last thing you heard, then the next thing you read is, that there was a man of the house of Levi who took a Levite wife, and he had a boy. They did it anyway. See, Pharaoh has decreed death, but these two parents build their family anyway. That by itself, friends, is just powerful. Families are built for the future. Families are built for the future. And sometimes they're built in the face of real uncertainty. Now, I've felt this, I've thought this, I've heard this, I've had this conversation a lot, and I get it, I understand it. We see the world around us, we're concerned about the future, and people say things like, I don't know how people can have child and children inside of this culture. I get that, I understand that. But put yourself in the place of the Israelite slaves in Exodus chapter one. You see, it says three times, at least in that chapter, that the children of God multiplied greatly. Remember, even some of that language um, insinuated that they were like insects, they were everywhere. That's uncertainty, they're living as slaves. Families are built for the future, and Christian families are built with the vision of the future where a good and sovereign God is the main actor. So they have a boy anyway. They have two sons, as a matter of fact. They have a daughter. Families are built for the future. There is a note of hope inside of the Christian family. Something else cool happens inside of this passage, and we make note of this along the way, and in fact, Saturday morning, there's gonna be a lot of this going on because I think it helps uh, help us understand the richness of what happens in the book of Exodus. But mom and dad right now don't have names. We're gonna actually learn their names later on, but mom and dad don't have names. It's as if the text is saying something like this. Two ordinary people got married, and they had a baby boy. Two extraordinary, ordinary people just do what they naturally do and they have a boy. And now, God is at work in powerful ways. There are some other really great twists inside of the text. In our vernacular, we would call them Easter eggs. They're little hints of things that came from the past. They're little hints of things that are going to come in the future, but they're buried inside of this text, and they just make the text rich and beautiful. In the ESV, it says they had a boy, and when she, when the mother saw that he was a fine child, other texts say he was a beautiful child, or he was a good or goodly child. There are many words that could be used to convey that kind of thought in the Hebrew, but the word that the writer of Exodus uses is the same phrase that is used in Genesis chapter one when God creates and at the end of each day he proclaims that all of it is good. So there's this note that is struck with the birth of Moses that there's something interesting happening here. This is how mom and dad value this child. And the text is saying, I want to remind you of God's creation of all things, and I want to hint at what else God is recreating through the life of his people, Israel. And then when it says just a sentence or two later that they decided they want to save the baby boy, do everything they can to do that, she takes a basket 
And she makes this basket waterproof, and she puts the child Moses inside of the water. The word that is used for basket in the text there is a word in the Hebrew that's only used in two stories in the Old Testament, the story of Moses in the water and the story of Noah in the ark. This is the word for ark. So as God saves and judges the world through the flood and Noah's ark, where we're getting a hint that God is going to both save and judge at the same time with the baby boy who has also been placed in a little tiny ark just big enough for a three-month-old boy. God is at work at something. In fact, you might even say, given the weight of the text and what God does, is that God is saving the world again. It's beautiful stuff that happens in this passage of Scripture. But mom and dad, a Levite mom, a Levite dad, they're another example to us of the defiance of evil. And friends, notice how this works. I think this is so critical for us. These two individuals do not have the power to overthrow Pharaoh, but they do have the power to have a baby boy and save his life. What do we do in the face of what do we do in the face of things that are evil or oppressive or um, you know, unjust? What do we do? We want to tear the whole system down and we want to fix it all, but none of us in this room have that power. We do have the power to obey God instead of men when we come up against it. We do have the power to live as if God is still in control. What is in my hand to do? How is it that I can obey God above all else? Remember that phrase that controlled the text for us last week? They feared God instead of Pharaoh, so they just saved as many children as they possibly could. We see that obedience to God's commands shapes his people and reminds us of what we said last week. It breaks the back of sin and evil. Obedience to God breaks the back of sin and evil. This even includes the basic moral commands that God has put in every human heart. See, Pharaoh's daughter doesn't have the advantage of being a daughter of Abraham, having some kind of memory of the God who set up his people and organized all of this. She doesn't have that, but what she does have is the law of God built inside of her. And so when she sees and hears the cries of this child, she chooses compassion instead of murder, and she saves the baby boy. It reminds me of this passage of Scripture that, as a matter of fact, we Christians think a lot of uh, now, and we, we, we... We deal with this, with uh, the the negative side of this passage of Scripture, but I want us to think about it with the positive side of this this morning. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18, 19, and 20, the Apostle Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We think of that idea often. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. See, the other side of that coin is, Paul is saying this, God has put his moral law in the human heart. Paul goes so far as to say they are without excuse. The invisible qualities of God, God has made visible in the hearts and minds and consciences of individuals. But what we do in our unrighteousness and in our sin, we suppress it and we suppress it and we suppress it. And so God gives us over to our sin. You see, God has placed that inside of our hearts. God has put his law in human hearts. So one of the critical roles for faithful Christians and faithful churches is as reminders of the good moral law of God. We listen to the law of God. We obey the law of God. We live out the law of God. We proclaim the good moral law 
of God. This is one of our jobs. This is part of what it means to be salt and light inside of this world. So mom and dad have a son. They decide we're going to save this son because he is a good son. They put him in an ark. They place him on the water. Now, this is interesting because how many baby boys of the Hebrews have been thrown into the same Nile in order to drown? So she places him in the water, this time hoping that he will be saved. Moses' older sister, again, we don't get her name here, but we get her name later on. She turns out to be a very powerful woman of God. She hides inside of the shrubbery at the, on the riverbank. And the literature here is great because you and I, we have to act a little bit like we've never read this before. We're sort of peering over her shoulder and we're thinking, what's going to happen? So many boys have drowned in this river. We're trying to save this one. What will happen next? Who will show up? That's, leads us, that leads us into our next part of the passage. Chapter 2, verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, again, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of someone who maybe hasn't ever read this story. You just don't know what's going to happen next. You know that Pharaoh's decree is all baby boys of the Hebrews are going to be drowned in the river. We're trying to save this one. The drama is what happens next. Who shows up first but the daughter of the man who commanded that all baby boys should be drowned in the river that Moses is on? What's going to happen? It's traumatic what happens. And what she does, this princess of Egypt, what she does is she reveals the hand of God at work. The text is clear for us. She sees the baby. They open the basket. Moses is crying, and she takes pity on him. She hears the cries of the child, and she responds with a mother's heart. She responds in compassion that is deep enough to defy the evil of her father. I mean, it's a powerful twist inside of the story. And it's not just that it's a baby boy, just some random baby boy. She says, this is a Hebrew boy. She knows what's supposed to happen with these kids. She knows that this is from the slave class, the class hated by her father, and she saves the child anyway. Her action, and the way the story builds it, her action mirrors or foreshadows what's going to happen later between God and his people. She hears the cries of Moses. She has compassion on him, and she has the power to save him, and so she does. And that's how the text unfolds a little bit later on when God talks to Moses. He tells Moses, I have heard the cries of my people, and I will come to them, and with my strong arm, with my power, I will save them. So again, the text just leads us step by step through what happens. And this is also an important piece, I think, of the book of Exodus something we need to keep at least part of our eyes on as we move through this passage. There is a profound lack of ethnocentrism in Exodus. God is saving his people. The Israelites are his people. He's going to draw them out of Egypt. But we're going to notice this again. The early heroes inside of this book, they're women, and most of them are not Hebrews. 
And then later on, when God gives his people his law, he says, okay, this is your law. This is my character. Now I want you to live as if you belong to me. And he's going to tell them, I'm making you a nation of priests. I want you to bring this law to the rest of the world because they need to know it. That's their job. That's our job. So even though he's saving his people, he's saving his people for the sake of the rest of the world. Now, the story, it's familiar to many of us, so we lose the, the, the profound irony at work inside of this passage. The sister shows up and says, hey, I see you have a little baby boy there. What a coincidence. Shall I go and call a nurse from among the Hebrew women to take care of the child? The daughter of Pharaoh says, that's a really good idea. So Moses' sister goes and gets Moses' mother, and she comes to Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter says, take the child. And we learn later on, it's about three years that she has Moses inside of her own household. Not only that, she's being paid by Pharaoh to take care of this boy that was supposed to be killed. God is at work in powerful ways. And then something cool again happens inside of the text. Pharaoh's daughter names him. She said, I'm going to give him the name Moses. She says, because I've drawn him out of the water. The Hebrew name Moses means to draw out. But there's something else inside of this as well. There's an Egyptian version of the name Moses that just is simply a way of saying the son of. So it's as if Pharaoh's daughter has hidden this Hebrew child inside of Pharaoh's household by giving him a name that would not raise any suspicions in that household. But she knows, we know, mom knows, sister knows, he's a Hebrew child. This is Moses. He's been drawn out of the water. This great story reminds us such important things for the people of God. And the first is this. God is the main character in the lives of his people. How else is this going to happen? How else is this going to unfold except God is at work? Except that this is what Pharaoh's daughter is like, that this is the courage of the Levite mom and dad and the older sister. This is the courage of the midwives in the face of profound evil. It is because God is the main character in the lives of his people. And the people of God, friends, you and I need to learn how to live like this, to see life like this. How many of you have ever said, I don't know how people get along without Jesus Christ. You see, that's that sense inside of us. That what's great about God in our day-to-day -day lives is that he is the main character in the lives of his people. We mentioned this earlier on in the book of Exodus, and I'm going to encourage you again to read out of the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 136. Um, a big chunk of the middle of that psalm is a reminder of the people of God of what God did to free them from the land of, of Egypt. But Psalm 136 has this incredible uh, structure to it. It's call and response. So the individual reading Psalm 136 reads one line, and the people of God respond with, His steadfast love endures forever. Pastor Brooks uh, prayed this with us this morning. And then the caller says another line, speaks another thing about the goodness and greatness of God. And the people of God respond with, his steadfast love endures forever. And what happens in Psalm 136 is that the very first things we talk about are the creative goodness and power of God. His steadfast love endures forever. He drew the waters up from the deep. His steadfast love endures forever. And then we get into the history of God's people. And he killed the firstborn in Egypt and released us as slaves. His love, his, his steadfast love endures forever. He parted the Red Sea and we walked on dry land. His steadfast love endures forever. It's a way for the people of God to recall everything that has happened and to put it in the context of God is the main character. Whatever it is, they even speak of slavery. His steadfast love endures forever. And it strikes me as I've spent some time thinking about this this week, I want to take this seriously for a moment. 
You know, I can say these kinds of things. You know, the people of God need to see life through these kinds of lenses. Psalm 136 helps us do that. I want to do it for just a moment. I want to practice this for just a moment. I want you to think, to stick in your brain a moment of the goodness of God in your life. Any moment of goodness, small, great, whatever it is. I just want you to take a second and I want you to put in your mind a moment of the goodness of God. You hold it there. We lay it at the feet of Jesus Christ and then I want you to say with me, his steadfast love endures forever. So say it with me. His steadfast love endures forever. Now I want you to take a moment of pain, a moment of hurt, a moment of confusion, possibly even something that is still an open wound. Hold it in your heart, And in your mind's eye, place it at the feet of Jesus Christ and say it with me again. His steadfast love endures forever. I want you to take a thought about the future, hope, a concern, confusion, the darkness, the fog of what lays before you that you don't know what to do with. Hold that in your heart for a moment. I want you to lay it at the feet of Jesus Christ and say with me, his steadfast love endures forever. God is the main character in our lives. Whatever it is, God is the main character of our lives. We have to come face to face with this as well. We have to be reminded of this, and we're reminded of it over and over in Exodus In so many ways, God chooses to use the obedience of his people. You see, friends, when we come to terms with the truth that you and I are in the hands of the sovereign, good God of the universe, what else can we do but obey that God? What else can we do but obey that God? And God chooses to use the obedience of his people. God will overwhelm Egypt with his power. He will do it. But he will also use the obedience of ordinary, nameless people to accomplish his will. Part of the story that leads up to this moment comes near the end of the story of Joseph and his family in Genesis chapter 50. In Genesis 50, and Joseph is working with his brothers. He's speaking to them. And he says this, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. See, Joseph looks back on his life and he realizes, who's the main character? Who's the main actor? You enslaved me. But God was at work doing something else. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. His brothers knew that the the other shoe had fallen. (laughs) Joseph had all the power in the world to kill all of them. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Whatever you think you were doing to destroy me, God was doing something else. And what God was doing, so much more powerful than what you thought you were going to do. I was reminded of this passage in 2 Timothy as well, because Paul talks to Timothy in the church about very similar kinds of things, and here's how he puts it. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. Let the world do what it does. This this is what sinners do. This is what a broken world does. You keep on following Jesus Christ. I need you to follow Jesus. Do what you have learned. Remember where you've learned it and move forward. 
So in Exodus chapter 2, Moses is born, and there's all this beauty and power inside of that part of the story. Moses is saved by the most unlikely series of events. And then Moses grows up. In the text in the book of Exodus, we go straight from three months old to 40 years old. And I want to read this next section. We're going to come back to it. And we're going to deal with more of it next week. But there's, there's one particular point I want to make as we continue to think about what it means to obey God and how God is at work in those kinds of things. So let's read beginning in verse 11 in Exodus chapter 2. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, the one who was, who was the aggressor, he was in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. And Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. There's just so much going on. Acts chapter 7 contains the story of the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in the church. But before Stephen is stoned, he's standing before the religious authorities and he's explaining to them how their Old Testament ways have actually led to the person of Jesus Christ, the one that they have rejected. And a lot of that story is the story of Moses and the Exodus from Egypt. And so in Acts chapter 7, he tells us that Moses is 40 years old when he flees into Midian. And we're going to return to this because there's a lot going on inside of this passage, but the story that we just read raises several issues for us. It actually acts as a microcosm for what God calls Moses to do, to free, to free the children of Israel from the tyranny of Egypt. But the first attempt doesn't go so well. He kills an Egyptian, buries him in the sand. He's been looking around. Nobody sees me. I'm going to get away with this. It turns out everybody saw him, and he didn't get away with it. He knew it was a capital crime. Pharaoh, someone who probably was raised beside him for 40 years, right, is now, is now someone who can actually take his life, and he knows it. But we get a glimpse into Moses' character, and this is something that will be developed over the next couple of chapters. Moses shows a unique kind of courage in the face of injustice. This is something that's just inside of Moses. But the story hinges on a decision that Moses makes. Go back to that first verse that we read, verse 11. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Moses had access to and likely had a lifelong future in the household of Pharaoh, the ultimate in privilege and power in his world. He could have chosen that as his people, but he doesn't do that. He knows, however, that his people, the Hebrews, are slaves. So he walks among them, he observes injustice, and he takes action against Egypt. According to the language, the way the New Testament puts this moment, Moses chose to identify with his people and with their slavery instead of with Egypt. And he chooses to identify them even in the face of the difficulty that will come to him because of that choice. So he chooses rather to be identified with slaves than to live in privilege and ease in Egypt. Part of how the New Testament puts this decision, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. 
I want to take this moment to talk about something that is just, it is a hot topic in our culture right now. It is a confusing and a destructive topic in our culture right now. We are a culture that is obsessed with the concept of identity. We're obsessed the notion of who am I? Who gets to choose who I am? What am I like? Is this kind of identity flexible? Where do I find it? What is it? How do I express my authentic identity? We as a culture are obsessed with it. Now, the notion of identity is actually a relatively recent obsession. Scripture doesn't use this term. We use it all the time. But this part of Moses' story helps us see something about our identity as people of God. As our culture understands it, identity is all about me. Maybe because the word starts with the letter I, I think it's about me, I don't know. Who else gets to say who I am? Who else gets to decide what I am like, the choices that I get to make? I need to be able to express my authentic self, my identity. The way our culture builds it, it's all about me. On top of that, whatever identity choices I make should, as a matter of fact, be forced on other people. It's not just a matter of I've chosen this, but others have to be forced to see it as well. On top of that, I can change my identity. Not even my biology really has much to do with my identity at all. I just get to make these choices. Our culture thinks this is a moral advance. Our culture thinks this is a version of freedom from. Freedom from whatever. Our culture believes that. But as a matter of fact, all of this talk about identity, what it does is it reveals a deep confusion and insecurity about who we are. That's what it does. Because we're answering the question, I don't know who I am, so who will I be? I get to choose it and on and on. It doesn't expose or reveal freedom or a moral advance. It's insecurity about who we are. It's confusion. It's anxiety about our lack of meaning and purpose. Every human being is created in the image of God. And this is where the identity of every human being is rooted. So when we get rid of that, when we get rid of God, when we mock that notion, however we do it, if we get rid of that, then we're at drift in a sea of anxiety about who we are. So we have this deep confusion about identity. Friends, the foundation of who I am is a creature made in the image of God and as a child of God who's been saved by his grace, the very foundation of my identity is I am a sinner saved by grace. That's who I am. I'm a sinner who is saved by grace. My identity begins and ends with my creator God and my savior Jesus Christ. The follower of Jesus Christ has something else entirely at their disposal. Not just that sense of anxiety of what will I choose, what am I supposed to say, what are others supposed to say about me. Friends, that's just a rat's nest of anxiety. The follower of Jesus Christ has something so much more foundational and enduring and meaningful to rest on. Imagine the influence of the church if Christians chose to identify with Christ even if it is hard instead of choosing selfishness and relative ease. Moses chose to identify with his God and with his people even though he knew it was going to mean difficult. He could have chosen ease. He didn't. I don't know how else to put this. This has been burning inside of me this week. And oftentimes when things burn inside of me for a few days, I stumble over myself because I don't know exactly how to put it. Men and women of God need to choose Jesus Christ because this is right and good and true, even if it's hard. <laughs> what we tend to choose 
is what is selfish, riddled with anxiety and insecurity, but there's something else to choose. There's someone else to identify, and it is with my Savior, Jesus Christ. We choose what is right and good even when it's hard. One of these things is the decision to join the kingdom of God, to pour our lives into something hard but meaningful. It is countercultural, but it is true and good. This is like putting gold alloy into a furnace and getting pure gold out. That's what this choice is like. And these are the people. I mean, we think of the role that Moses plays. Then we think about what it means for you and me to choose Jesus Christ instead of conformity to our culture. These are the people who make a difference. These are the people who stick out in good ways. It is always the reformer that changes things. It's always the reformer that sticks out and people don't know what to do with them because culture says something else entirely and then someone, sums up, someone stands up and says, but no, the truth is different. Follow Christ, follow the truth. We take the slings and the arrows, but it's the right thing to do. The other choice is what the book of Hebrews called the fleeting pleasures of sin. The King James says the pleasures of sin for just a season of life. It's the easy choice, it's the selfish choice, but it's dissatisfying, it's fleeting. It doesn't give us the meaning and purpose that we have in Jesus Christ. One choice is like putting that gold alloy in a furnace and getting gold back. The other choice is like putting old steel in a bucket of water and leaving it there until there's nothing but rust. It just disintegrates into nothing. The choice to conform accepts our culture's desire. Our culture right now wants to mow the entire lawn to the same height. All of the grass, all of the flowers, all of the bushes, all of the trees, we're gonna level everyone off and everyone's going to conform. We're not gonna let any of these things grow. That's the choice to allow yourself to be mowed down by culture to look and sound and feel like them instead of being what Christ has called you to be. I love this quote from Austin Guinness in his book, The Call. Answering the call of our creator is the ultimate why for living the highest source of purpose in human existence. Apart from such a calling, all hope of discovering purpose will end in disappointment. Moses literally had the world at his disposal, and he chose to be a Hebrew instead. He chose to be a child of God instead. Moses eventually returns with the calling and with the power of God, and because of what Moses does in God's power, his people are saved. And we choose as the children of God to bear the name of Jesus Christ for our own salvation and to be a light to the rest of the world that is lost in darkness. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.